Well, thank you very much, Eric, and uh, a good afternoon, or maybe good morning. Uh, it was really a wonderful invitation um, to be part of this program. And uh, as Eric has already hinted, I really, uh, although I was asked to talk more specifically about um, global food security challenges, what I'd like to do in my remarks today is really focus on one platform that we in the United States believe is going to provide a whole new set of opportunities for us to collaborate uh, on uh, nationally and, and internationally, and that's open data. Um, I also want to note uh, that uh, we also have a, uh, a, a directive from President Obama issued in 2010 uh, that all government agencies, uh, particularly the research agencies, enter into public-private partnerships to facilitate technology transfer uh, and to maximize the uh, return on the investment that's being made in scientific research by speeding uh, the application of that research. And the way that that can be done is through public-private partnerships. So um, I'd like to give you a, a brief introduction to the mission area within the Department of Agriculture that I have responsibility for. It's called Research Education and Economics. This is uh, a $2.8 billion uh, portfolio that is administered by four agencies within the department. Uh, and as shown on this slide, the three um, uh, orange blocks to the, the left under the REE mission area are our three intramural science and statistical agencies. The Agricultural Research Service uh, administers uh, through a network of 90 laboratories uh, in the United States and also including five located in other countries. Uh, our intramural research program on agricultural production, human nutrition, food safety, natural resources preservation, climate change adaptation, uh, biofuels and other bioproducts development. And six of those uh, 90 centers are human nutrition research centers. Um, the second uh, uh, agency that's shown there, the Economic Research Service, as its name implies, conducts economic research. Uh, most of that with a policy direction, and they also make a very substantial contribution to our nutrition programs uh, with respect to establishing an, the economic research basis for the food assistance programs. Uh, the National Agricultural Statistics uh, Agency uh, does several hundred surveys a year and every five years conducts a census of agriculture where they attempt to interview all of the over two million farmers uh, within the country, develop out of that uh, a lot of information that informs many program decisions as they relate to, uh, to our farm programs. And uh, the fourth agency, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, is our extramural agency, and it provides grant uh, support as well as formula funding uh, that goes to support research that's conducted in universities across the U.S. Uh, since 2008, uh, the Undersecretary for REE has also had another hat to wear. Uh, Congress uh, directed in 2008 that uh, the Undersecretary also function as the Chief Scientist for the Department. And in the U.S., not all departments have a person with that designation, but many do, and increasingly um, it is a, a designation that, that is being uh, 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 promulgated uh, in legislation 
uh, to the departments that at this point do not have that type of, of uh, person. Uh, but as the chief scientist for the department, I have a very small office of about a dozen people that helps to support that role, uh, which includes establishing the research priorities for all of the agencies within the department. There is research that is being conducted and sponsored by agencies outside of this mission area. A good example of that is forestry research that's being conducted within the Forestry Service and vaccine development that is being uh, conducted by the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. Um, but the uh, national, uh, the Office of the Chief Scientist uh, also has the responsibilities for administering our programs as they relate to the ethical conduct of science uh, within the, uh, the, the department. Uh, we've been given the responsibility for open data policies as they relate to research and scientific databases. And also, um, this position is the place where we are able to provide directly to the secretary advice about science as it relates to policy decisions that are on the secretary's agenda. So. Um, Within the U.S., um, we've also been implementing um, since uh, 2013 a directive from the president uh, to provide open access to our research and our administrative data. Uh, open access to the research data um, is uh, a, a reflection of the uh, uh, concept that uh, the, the, the federal government's support of research comes from the public's tax dollars. And so the results of that science should be broadly available to the, to the public. Um, we have uh, as well uh, a long-standing uh, research relationship uh, with our colleagues here in Canada. Uh, and we have bilateral research relationships with many other countries uh, and are active participants in the Feed the Future uh, government-wide approach towards uh, development um, in, in the world. Uh, so that gives you a brief overview of um, our mission area. And I want to direct my comments today, though, to the data revolution and how we, within the nutrition and the food science community, uh, should be playing a, a greater role uh, in uh, conceptualizing how we're going to be using the data revolution and also driving towards uh, implementation of the policies that are going to make that work for us and also work for us as we're working towards achieving the sustainable development goals. So there is a worldwide movement that's going on. If you didn't know, it's called the data revolution. And uh, one of the concepts underlying this is that we need to make data available for public use. Uh, it has to be uh, broadly accessible in machine-readable form, and it also has to be discoverable. You have to be able to find it in order to actually make use of it. Open data is expected to generate new insights, drive better decision making, and enable governments and civil society and the private sector to better target interventions and programs. And such open data will also improve service delivery, uh, spur innovation, strengthen accountability, and create whole new kinds of value and growth. Uh, in the developed world, a lot of this motivation is to drive research and entrepreneurship uh, that uh, can be built off of these uh, open data platforms. And in the developing world, a lot of the motivation for advocacy for countries to adopt open data policies is to expose corruption and uh, to address inefficiencies in the way that government is administering funds. We believe that increased availability and more effective use of our research and programmatic data have the potential to be really powerful drivers towards achieving the global sustainable development goals. 
And countries, including the US, have adopted open data policies and are creating the infrastructure to make available at no cost the scholarly publications and the underlying data that are the result of the public investment in research, along with many administrative data sets. So in the US, we've established uh, a, a data system now that's called PubAg. Uh, so all of the research scholarly publications that uh, are the result of our agency's funding are now going to be available through PubAg. And we're in the process of creating an Ag Data Commons. So if the underlying data in those publications is not already being uh, delivered and made available through one of the existing data repositories, and there are many of them in the genetics and genomics areas. We heard about some of them under the JPI program also uh, this morning. But um, if there is not a place for the data to uh, be made publicly available, then the Ag Data Commons will be where that is stored and made available. So there's a rich data infrastructure that's emerging uh, in the food and agricultural and nutritional sciences. And um, there's also um, uh, a further need, though, um, for collaboration about what are the priorities that we want established when governments continue trying to make their data publicly available, but uh, at this point don't have guidance from the scientific community about what would be the next set of priorities for databases to make available. I should note that Canada also has an open data policy that predates that in the United States, um, and that both countries have got in place um, protections for personal identifier information. You don't want that to be disclosed. Uh, we have uh, also protections for, against disclosing uh, commercial and proprietary information that may come to the regulatory agencies as part of their work of uh, providing for the safety of products that are brought to market. And of course, there are protections against uh, making it publicly available information that would um, be in, not in furthering of the, the national security. Um, and last year, uh, Canada hosted the International Open Data Congress here in Ottawa, uh, and it was very well attended and a, really a very stimulating meeting. Um, agriculture is a critical part of uh, this open data infrastructure. We're all familiar with the, the figures that are talked about of the uh, anticipated global demand for food uh, to respond to the growing population that's projected to exceed 9 billion by the year 2050. And uh, open data, particularly open data relevant to agriculture and nutrition, um, really does have a very important role uh, to play uh, with respect to long-term sustainable development, improving economic opportunities for farmers, contributing to the health of all consumers, and also providing opportunities to those entrepreneurs wherever they are. Uh, in the developed and in the developing world to build businesses off of open data. So making open data work for agriculture and nutrition is going to require um, those of us within the research communities uh, to increase the supply, the quality, and also the interoperability of the data alongside action to build the capacity for the use of those data uh, by all stakeholders. And I think those of us in the nutrition research community uh, have a tradition that we can be proud of, of providing access to our data, particularly the food composition data. That we have a long history of doing that. And also of our nutrition survey data, where we have ways of protecting those prote personal identifiers um, that's very uh, important um, for long-term um, credibility of these data sets. Uh, we also have a history of using administrative data. 
And I can remember over 30 years ago, the first article that I read by Dr. Eileen Kennedy, where she made use of our WIC program data. So this is a program of food packages for women during pregnancy and for infants and, and young children. And she linked WIC, WIC administrative data with uh, Medicare data, the uh, program that provides medical care for poor people and demonstrated that WIC program participants had lower health care bills. And that has, is often one of the arguments that's still being made today in support of why the WIC program is a very important program. So there are many other administrative data sets that might be useful for nutrition policy and program activities and information coming from the research community about which of those would be the best next candidates for doing the work that we have to do in order to provide open access for them, I think would be a very important message from the nutrition community. So with the Sustainable Development Goals, we also have another reason um, for arguing for open access to agriculture and food data. Um, very ambitious goal to eliminate hunger uh, by 2030, and uh, increasing the release and the use of open data at the institutional and national and international levels could be a big benefit uh, towards those working to achieve our uh, sustainable development goal number two. Um, major funding bodies of the agri-food and nutrition research areas are, are making open access mandatory. It's clear by our government policies. Um, and uh, the, globally, um, there is a, a, an increasing uh, political will uh, to address the sustainability of agriculture and nutrition through open data and open access within different international policy and research and development, as well as private sector activities. Um, I would also challenge all of us to start thinking about and talking about uh, open data as being a global public good, uh, particularly as it relates to food and nutrition, and vital to uh, promoting sustainable development. Uh, an econo economist, uh, Paul Samuelson, um, is usually credited for developing the theory of public goods. He published in 1954 a paper that's become a real classic that's called The Pure Theory of Public Expenditure, where he laid out that a public good is a good that's both non-excludable and non-rivalrous, and that individuals cannot be effectively excluded from using the good, and where use by one individual does not reduce the availability of that good to others. So the term a public good, and, and even broader, a global public good, has come to mean a public good that's non-rivalrous, non-excludable, and can be used throughout the world. So that leads me then to an organization that's called Global Data for Agriculture and Nutrition, or GODAN for short. Um, this is a, an initiative that was launched just three years ago. Uh, it is the first global open data initiative that includes public and private entities, um, donors, which are mostly countries, uh, international organizations and businesses. Uh, and uh, this is a completely voluntary organization that has a shared purpose. Uh, so again, launched just a few years ago. It's grown now to have over 250 members. Uh, it includes governments, uh, non-governmental organizations, and uh, private sector uh, companies. Um, the focus is on high-level policy and institutional support for open data. Uh, in the public and the private sectors. Uh, it encourages collaboration and cooperation among the existing agriculture and open data activities. 
and really has an emphasis on trying to share information so that we're not duplicating the work that is already going on, but rather making that uh, information available and, and building on it. And it seeks to bring together all stakeholders to solve longstanding global problems. We welcome uh, anyone uh, who shares the purpose to join as a member and to participate in shaping the activities that are being undertaken under the partnership. And uh, I'd like to challenge everybody here um, to think about having your organization join GoDan and work with us. Uh, there are several working groups uh, within uh, the, uh, the partnership, and one of them uh, is focusing on, on nutrition. Finally, uh, we are planning uh, the first global uh, summit uh, in uh, September uh, of this year. Uh, it is being uh, uh, planned uh, with a, a planning committee with representation from uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the government of Kenya, the United States, uh, the One Campaign, uh, if you're not hip, that's Bono's uh, organization, uh, and, uh, and a relatively new organization called PUSH, Presidents United to Solve Hunger, which are the presidents of several uh, uh, dozens of universities around the world where the university president has pledged the resources of that university to solve hunger on campus, in the community, in their nation, and, and globally. Um, we'll be releasing information very shortly uh, about the, uh, the, the summit meeting. Uh, there will be a series of events uh, starting next month, leading to a major event, as I said, in mid-September, in advance of the UN General Assembly meeting in New York City. If you'd like more information about GoDan and uh, how to become a partner, uh, the website is uh, godan.info, and uh, as I said, there'll be more information about the summit meeting coming up. So, um, in conclusion, I, I, I think we within the nutrition community really need to start conceptualizing um, how we can take advantage of this global data revolution, uh, both to advance our science and to advance its applications. Um, we need also to be prioritizing what are the data sets we want our governments to be releasing and making that information known to those government officials. Uh, we have some great opportunities coming up with, uh, we hope very soon, the relaunch of the dietary reference intakes process. Um, what open data would help us to advance the establishment of the DRIs? That's a question we haven't talked about. Um, there's been mention this morning of microbiome, epigenetics, uh, phenotyping activities, the brain initiative and cognition, all of those also with open data provide us in the nutrition community ways of doing research that we have yet to begin to capitalize on. So I think there's enormous opportunities there. And certainly from the public health perspective, um, administrative data that can be used to better understand um, how public policy and programs are influencing nutrition and nutritional status and how they can be used more effectively also present some interesting uh, opportunities for research. So uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, the opportunity to come and, and talk with you today about a, a new approach uh, towards thinking about nutrition and how to further our impact globally and also to achieve our sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. That was excellent. And I certainly uh, support your uh, uh, data, global data, uh, big data generation. But, but there are some barriers um, that we face in Canada uh, because
because of our healthcare system. We're, we're provincially regulated for healthcare, so the, the provinces guard their administrative databases. And, you know, until we can get, it's all right if we're doing a national survey, uh, you know, like our Canadian Community Health Surveys, that we have national data, but linking that to provincial medical databases is a much greater barrier than you have Medicare or Kaiser or whatever. Um, and we're trying to address these issues. Uh, I'm co-lead in trying to bring together 28 pregnancy birth cohorts across the country uh, that comes from shore to shore. And uh, all I can say is we hope that the software of the future is going to be, allow us to do more things in the clouds that data won't really have to move. But um, it's just not as simple here to take research data that's been generated in a single institution or a single province and then link it <laughs> to national things. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of us would love to be there, but it's, unless it's nationally collected data, it, it's a, a struggle for us at the moment. Well, I, I think you make a very good point, Stephanie. And you know, it, 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 depending on where you are, which country you're in, what particular field of work you're doing, we all have those kinds of barriers. So you know, that are, that are peculiar to the way our systems have have been developed. Um, so I, I applaud you for for the work that you're doing, and and for also trying to identify, you know, how can some of those hurdles be. Be, be overcome. Um, we're also finding um, it's much easier to go proactively into the future and establishing what the, what the priorities are for the data sets, you know, identifying those uh, uh, in advance of, that will be publicly available and then building the system so that it make that possible as opposed to looking retrospectively and identifying, well, what are the data sets that are important that we'd like to make available? And then putting the, because it takes work in order to do it. Um, frequently, there needs to be some cleanup on the data. Frequently, there needs to be documentation provided because that hasn't been developed. So there, there is work that needs to be done uh, in order to make the data sets uh, actually useful when, when they're made publicly available. So um, all of that is, is, takes time, takes effort, takes money, and sometimes there are um, peculiarities of the way a system is established that are really substantial hurdles to get over. Yeah, if we could just get everybody using the same uh, data definition panels, <laughs> that would be a, a big start. Yes. But creating metadata out of um, studies that have been done in the past is, although there is software now to try to help with that, so I'm all um, you know, behind you and let's try to look to the future and yeah. get some sort of uh, you know, um, consistency amongst how data is collected and how it's defined. Yeah. Definitely, and that's where having a conversation internationally would be very helpful in the nutrition community. And you know, some of the work that you're doing in Europe is getting us a long ways there. Hi, Catherine, Carolyn O'Brien. I'm uh, with Canada Brand, but also with the U of T program in food safety. And some of the dialogue we've recently had was, was related to lack of um, easy access to data from the state. Canada. And my question is, how much do you think the directive from Obama in 2010 for technology transfer and um, facilitating more sharing openness of data, how much did that influence the direction that we take in the U.S.? And should we get Justin Trudeau to have some <laughs> Well, I understand that Mr. Trudeau had an open data plank in his in his platform, and uh, so my expectation is that the administration is going to probably be paying attention to open data. On the statistical side, I have responsibility for two statistical agencies, uh, NAS and, and the Economic Research Service is also designated a statistical agency. 
They, um, there are issues around these personal identifiers. Uh, and particularly um, given the structure of agriculture in US and Canada where there are increasingly large farms, um, they can be pretty easily picked out if you're having a county level uh, provision of, of, of data, you know, if the access is to the county level. Um, so uh, one of those steps that we have to take is um, Ident uh, within any of the, the statistical data sets, um, providing data access only down to the level of aggregation where you're not able to pick out that individual farm or individual farmer. Um, that has posed for the research community sometimes objections. Uh, and the way that we've tried to get around those is, as I said, either providing the data at the lowest level of aggregation we can without uh, uh, permitting individuals to be identified, or alternatively, developing what are called data layers um, that uh, have been very helpful, particularly to the remote sensing community, um, as it's been um, doing a, a lot of work trying to link uh, remote sensing with, with on-the-ground um, crop estimation, for example. So there sometimes are workarounds that, that can be used um, for the statistical agencies. And that also, you know, to Stephanie's earlier question kind of goes to, you know, there are sometimes barriers um, that relate to these precautions that we want to make sure that we're protecting um, in, in order to uh, uh, make sure that people are going to want to continue to respond to the surveys and not be have their personal farm or income or whatever made widely available. Well, thank you so much for raising the issue of open data. And at our previous management board meeting for the JPI in uh, January, we adopted the FAIR principle. We call it FAIR. It's findable accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Ah, and, um, that... So that's the principle for open data, which is trying to become common now in Europe. Uh, it's also the priority of the uh, commissioner uh, for research, science, and innovation. So Carlos Oedas, he's from Portugal. But he has, as, he has three open issues, uh, which are the focus of his policy. It's open data, open science, and open to open the world. So it aligns very well. I think we should figure out uh, how we can somehow align with Gogan. Um, the other thing is that within Europe, there's another acronym, which is called ESFRI. It's the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures. And part of these research infrastructures are data banks, yeah. biobanks, and things like that. So I think uh, we all realize that it's silly to you know, spend a lot of money in uh, collecting data all the time. Where, where, all these data are available and can be reused. Thank you. Great. Well, I, I should also, just as a point of history, um, the this uh, global open data for agriculture and nutrition actually comes from uh, work started by the G7. Uh, and Godan was launched under the UK presidency of the, of the G7. So uh, it has a, a number of European countries very actively participating. Thank you for a really interesting talk. With the presidential directive that data has to be made openly accessible, are there sort of discussions or actions uh, in terms of mandating or what might be essential that is collected in, you know, in ongoing research programs in order to make the data have more common elements that can be used better, so it's not the situation Stephanie's describing that you're trying, or that you did, that you're trying to backfill with documentation and, and getting you know, usage.
Uh, and so all of the government agencies need to figure out how to implement that with the carve-outs of the three protections that I, that I talked about. So no, there's not any specific mandate about how to do it beyond that. It's you figure it out, what works for you in the kind of data that you are collecting in, in the data systems you're managing. And therein comes the necessity for discussions with the scientific community, discussions with the, 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 the public and private sectors, entities that are users and consumers of, of the data to find out what are the needs. How, how, how can we uh, build in um, requirements that will make this data more usable to you?